So I'm Matthew Siegel, I'm a child psychiatrist, as you heard, um, and I spend my clinical days and my research uh, effort uh, particularly focused on people with autism, as you heard, who have uh, who are severely affected, and many of them have fairly severe behaviors, really tough behaviors, like aggression, which is not verbal aggression, but hitting people, other people, or other actions like that, hitting themselves, uh, putting their head through walls, things like that. Um, and so that's the world that, that I live in and work with. Um, and this is kind of a cartoon representation of, of that world. Um, and so looking at that, your heart rate probably went up, your arousal level has gone up, uh, and so I have your attention, which is good. Um, so in the child therapy world, uh, we sometimes do this exercise called size of the problem, right? So is it a little problem or a big problem? And you try to help a child look at that and then look at options coming, is it a little problem or a big problem? So as an example, we might say that the, so every behavior we could rate, right? So the spouse not taking out the garbage behavior, in the context of today, that I would call a little problem. And the person with autism of whatever age um, engaging in very serious behaviors such as aggression or self-injury, I think we could all agree is a big problem. Um, so, and it's not the problem that we often see in the Hollywood version of autism, right, or the TV version. Um, and despite that, this is actually a somewhat common problem. It's not one we talk about a lot, but it is common. And so in one survey of children in the community, survey of parents, not a clinically referred sample, not a clinic survey, but a survey in the community, parents reported at that point in time, 5% of their kids engaging in physical aggression and 11% engaging in self-injurious behavior. And while estimates vary and the epidemiology on this is not very well described, many, a number of studies say that over the, the child lifetime, uh, up to 40 to 80% engage in one, of the, one or both of these behaviors at some point. So this is not an uncommon problem. Um, but why is it such a big problem? So that seems like an obvious question. It's, you know, there, it's obviously can be dangerous. And yes, that is true, and that, that is part of why it's a problem. Um, but I think the real problem with it is, as Dr. Gordon was showing, um, each person, all of us, and people with autism have a developmental trajectory. And hopefully, for the person with autism, that trajectory is being supported by a really strong applied behavioral analysis program, typically in school, a community integration program, where they're gaining life experiences and exposures and ultimately vocational opportunities and hopefully potentially employment. And they're getting health care and dental care from their providers. And, that's the and then we hope that they reach their trajectory and their potential. So let's tell a different story um, for some of the people that I see. So here's the, the same person, but on a different story, developing along on their trajectory. And then at whatever age this is, um, they develop physical aggression for whatever reason. And that starts happening with some intensity and frequency. So they go along and they get kicked out of their school program. And as you know, for kids with autism, the school is the delivery mechanism primarily for treatment, whether it's early intervention or onward through the educational system. So they get kicked out, they're at home, and the parents spend three months to three years trying to find a, a program or something that will accept them. And all the while, they're not receiving those services. And then um, the community integration providers quit because they understandably can't exposed and manage this behavior. So then we lose that access to the community and life skills and other things. Um, and then a couple years later, it's been a couple years and the person has not been able to see their primary care or their dental provider because those offices, perhaps understandably, can't tolerate that behavior um, and it's too dangerous for them. And so then we develop other medical problems. And so the real issue here is this developmental trajectory, all this time we're not accessing all the treatments and services that we all want people to access and we develop evidence for, and we can have fabulous things available, but if you literally can't be there and be present, then um, 
it's not doing you a lot of good on your development. And so then we end up not reaching whatever the individual's potential is. And so to me, this is the real crime. This is the real problem with aggression and self-injury. Yes, it's dangerous in the moment, but it is the long-term developmental effects that I think are most impairing. So um, there's another aspect of this that I want to talk about, and that is um, why, uh, what is, most, um, what is most impairing about aggression and self-injury? So we saw the effects, but what is most impairing about it? And you might say again, well, it's because it's dangerous. Um, but why, is it, why, why do kids get kicked out of school? Why can't families go out to dinner at a restaurant? And I think that the answer and an aspect of this that we really haven't engaged uh, comes from, as most answers do from pa parents and families and individuals. So this is Wendy, uh, who is the mother of Ryan, who's an adult with autism, I've known for a decade. Um, and this is Wendy's description of what has gone on and continues to go on over this past decade, despite his having a fabulous psychiatrist, uh, and more importantly, lots of services. Um, and so you can see that uh, this is her description of what, what has gone on and so he can no longer live in the home. Um, and so Wendy, I think, gives us a clue to the aspect of this that we haven't paid a lot of attention to, which is that it's very unpredictable, and it occurs with little to no warning signs. And yes, he's had tons of FBAs and behavioral analysis and all that, and yet still it occurs with little warning and unpredictably much of the time, even for the person who knows him the best, his mother, who's highly articulate. Um, so let's ask a really hard question. Um, where are we in understanding aggression and self-injury from a scientific standpoint for people with autism? Um, so going through this quickly, this is the classical approach to disease or problems that you learn in medical school, or this is a lot of the elements. So in order to understand a problem, such as chronic ear infections, uh, you want to know the epidemiology, the natural history, the etiology, in other words, what causes it, uh, what is the mechanism or the pathologic process. Uh, you want to have biomarkers, uh, such as culturing that ear infection and seeing what happens. Um, and then, of course, you want to have treatment. You want to have advanced treatment for refractory cases, et cetera. And so to display this a little bit, um, so you might say, where are we for um, having a sore throat? And I think that pretty much all these boxes are ticked if you have a sore throat, right? We know the epidemiology, if you're an adolescent with a sore throat, 90% is viral, 10% is bacterial. We know how to do the rest of these steps. And you know, to gloss over a lot of information, I'm gonna summarize and say that for aggression and self-injury and autism, despite a lot of work uh, and a lot of uh, interest over the past decades, um, I think this is kind of where we are. We actually don't have the epidemiology well described, particularly for adults. Um, we actually don't know the natural history. We haven't done any longitudinal studies, so I can't say to a parent this will or won't get better, uh, like you can say to some degree with something like Tourette's syndrome, uh, et cetera. And particularly, we really don't know the mechanism the pathology that underlies it. We certainly don't have biomarkers for it. And our treatments are kind of plus minus. Um, and so our treatments at this point are um, primarily two things. Applied behavioral analysis, which is incredibly important and well-researched, um, but has serious limitations. Uh, and I say this, that all the program, clinical programs I run are based on applied behavioral analysis. So I'm a huge advocate, however, it's expensive, it's time consuming, and it's very difficult to access unless you have access to you know, a particular center. Um, and it sometimes does not achieve describe, you know, the behavior and figuring out the function. And then we have medications, which um, we, I think, are somewhat still stumbling in the dark a bit because we still don't even understand the mechanism of how, if a medication does help, how is it helping? And then, of course, we have the issues of side effects, et cetera. So, um, that's kind of where we are, I think, if we're really honest about aggression and self-injury in autism. Um, and so I think we have to go back and replow ground and go back to mechanism. 
um, and try to understand this from a different approach. And you will hear people say in the field or even you know, program officers, oh, we've done that. You know, we did those med studies in the 90s and et cetera. And I think that we have a lot of opportunity perhaps to come at this in different ways. So I'm gonna give you one example briefly of how we're trying to come at this and not because you know, we have the best idea or something, but just as an example of trying to approach it in a different way. Um, so I think we have to go back to mechanism and uh, our thinking around this is, uh, here's a simplistic description, is that there's a triggering stimulus, whatever it is, could be a loud noise, could be a demand for uh, doing something. Uh, and the individual experiences distress. There's a physiologic response associated with that distress. Um, and then aggression or self-injury or something else occurs. And part of that occurrence is to modulate and re-regulate oneself. And so we know that there is a relationship between arousal and uh, behavior. And this is a graphic that's attempting to show um, that here's an individual, this is heart rate, so very simplistic physiology. Uh, their baseline, there's a rise in heart rate that precedes an aggressive episode where there is a high heart rate, but the key is the rise beforehand and then a fall and then back to baseline. And that figure is from my colleague, Dr. Goodwin. Um, so we have completed a pilot study trying to look at this cycle and see if it can tell us something about mechanism and that we can utilize clinically. Um, so we t had 20 uh, youth with minim who were minimally verbal, severely affected by autism, um, and we had them wearing a uh, wearable biosensor uh, that recorded some physiologic measures, uh, including heart rate and electrodermal activity, which is a measure of physiologic arousal. And we had a research assistant, or several, coding what actually happens, so coding their behavior, does aggression happen or not, and then we took those two data streams, the physiology and the truth, the behavior, and then offline fed it into our colleagues at Northeastern University in computer science, and they produced some algorithms and predictive models uh, using that data. And just with these 20 people, um, and this is a pilot study for sure, um, they were able to develop a model that could predict the onset of aggression 60 seconds in the future with 81% accuracy. Um, so that was encouraging. Again, very much a pilot and early study. Um, but good enough that I think we are now doing a much larger study um, where we are running 100 kids across multiple sites in Maine, Brown, and Pittsburgh. Um, to do the same thing, collect the data, two data streams, develop the classifier or the algorithm, uh, as it's better known, and we're gonna do that with 100 kids and train that algorithm, and then, more importantly, then take a new 100 kids and do this prospectively in real time where we uh, get rid of the person coding and instead the data is fed up into the cloud and in real time is processed by the algorithm and then makes a risk prediction and that's transmitted to staff and the staff then, and then we're gonna see how the staff respond to that, which is kind of an experiment within the experiment. So we're gonna do this prospectively in real time and see if we can predict the onset of these behaviors. And it's just the beginning, because of course, just as interesting as the onset is also actually the offset, because a huge question or a huge issue clinically is when do you re-engage with someone after they've had a difficult behavior, which is actually just as important, because if it's too soon, you're likely to generate a second episode. So um, that's what we're doing, and that's the approach. And again, I bring it up as perhaps an example of just a different way to come at these things and to try to go back to mechanism and first principles, and that is not uh, you know, setting aside in any way the very important work that's been done in applied behavioral analysis and in pharmacology, but I think there are other ways to come at this. And so why are we excited about this work? Um, and I'll just give you a couple thoughts and then end. Um, so I think the first reason we're excited is because 
it, this approach is agnostic and it's objective. And what I mean by that is it's agnostic to the stimulus. It doesn't matter what the antecedent was. It doesn't matter if it was a loud noise or a demand or whatever, which we spent a lot of time thinking about. It's worth thinking about it in ABA. But this approach is agnostic to that. The second thing is that it's objective. It is not based on observation or inference, et cetera. It is based on physiology. The second reason we're excited is because we're getting at one of the most, as we said, impairing features of this, which is the, the unpredictability. So we're trying to increase predictability of these behaviors. And then the third reason is because um, if we are successful in this, and that's a, a large if, uh, or someone else is success, successful with this kind of approach, I think we potentially open new windows for intervention, uh, being that if you have warning of something coming, then you can work in a very systematic way to try to decrease the chance that that happens through teaching people self-regulation strategies, et cetera. Um, so that opens up a new window, because most of our intervention at this point is reactive and after things occur, as opposed to before. Um, and so if all that occurs, we might approach what I think in our world we say is the holy grail, which is, um, and I think it is the holy grail for kids with autism and for all of us, which is you have a closed loop system where the individual themselves is signaled on where they are in terms of their agitation and physiology, and that's what this cartoon is trying to represent. And then you can teach them to self-regulate themselves and have a closed loop system that doesn't rely on caregivers and staff and teachers and et cetera. Um, and I'm, we're all probably trying to work toward that goal of self-regulating in a closed loop system, particularly when we're giving a talk. Um, <laughs> so in conclusion, uh, I would say that you know, uh, hopefully I've identified for you that aggression and self-injury are a big problem, that they're actually fairly common, even though not in the media about autism, that it is the unpredictability of these behaviors that in some ways cre creates the greatest impairment, certainly for families and I think individuals, and keeps them from accessing all the treatments that many people in the room are trying to develop. Um, and yet I remain, I think, really hopeful um, that if we can reimagine this old but somewhat intractable to this point problem, that we can replow this ground, go back to mechanism, and try to approach things in a different way. And either we or more likely other groups will develop new ways to come at these things and um, make progress and help people with autism be able to access everything they need and reach whatever their potential is. So thank you very much.